So I did a thing over a year ago. No, it was just under a year ago by now. And I made a little video about it, but someone else edited it and I did not enjoy that. So I'm kind of gonna go over what I did in that video and I'm just gonna say it again because I, PDA, I'm not gonna do that again. It's an important video, it's a really important video and I want it to be done right and I want to say everything that I wanna say and I want this to be out there. Before we keep going, hi, I'm Paige Leal. This is my uh, channel if you wanna come hang out here. I'm autistic and I talk about autism and stuff. It's only just recently got pointed out to me that the background looks like Boo's door from Monsters, Inc. and I realized Am I stupid? How did I not know that and plan it? Dumb. Anyway, I was asked to go to a conference held by an organization that y'all all need to know about because I really like them. The company's called AID Canada. So AID, A-I-D-E stands for Autistic Intellectual Disability Education. And AID Canada first came to me, it was over a year ago, and it was to write an article regarding autistic people visiting the doctor's office, which I will link below because I wrote an article for them, Ooh. but I was really pumped to connect with them because we have the same kind of idea, mission statement that education makes the world go round and the more resources we have for autistic people, about autistic people, the happier that our lives can be. So anyway, I'd worked with aid before and then they asked me to come to a conference that they were holding. So their office, their main office is in a little town just out of Vancouver, BC. I'm forgetting the name of the town, but it's just not Vancouver. They said, come on down, Paige, we're having an impossible conference. Well, that sounds tough. It doesn't mess around. This is what I love. And I just said the word mess around instead of F around. Guys, I'm getting mature. I'm doing it. It's like we see four big problems going on in the autistic community. Four problems that seem like they're impossible to solve. And we're going to try to solve them. Okay, we're going to try to solve them. And then how are we going to do that? We're going to get only the best minds in here to figure out what's the best way that we can solve. AID's goal was whatever we figure out, whatever y'all figure out about these four problems, that's what AID is going to be working on for the rest of the year. That's what I love to see. And that's what I love to hear. That's what I love to hear. <laughs> I love to hear that we are figuring it out. I am putting the money to it right now as an organization. So autistic community, we've got four impossible problems. I think you guys can agree with this. There's probably more. First impossible problem is autistic seniors. What do what do we do? What's going on with old autistic people? Do we got care for them? What's going on? Do they just fall through the cracks? We got to do something for autistic elders. Number two, how can people in rural environments and communities access mental health services? Just like people that don't have Wi-Fi, but like indigenous communities and Mennonites. Third impossible problem, non-speaking autistic people. Who and how can we advocate for them? Fourth and final problem, what are we doing about autistic people with self-injurious behaviors? Question, what what are we doing? What's going on there? These are very valid. I was very interested about who was going to be in attendance at this conference. And so I asked, there were going to be organizations from all around Canada, different autism organizations from all around Canada and their CEOs, but not just that, because I was like, well, okay, like yeah, swag, but I mean, it's good to bring the people with the money for sure. But also different social workers, teachers, parents of autistic people, autistic parents, autistic adults, autistic people in general, police officers, doctors, social workers, people that work with autistic people, anyone who has any insight on the autistic community, come on, let's go. Well, I mean, with invitation, I guess. So when you showed up, everyone was sorted into one of the four groups, one of the four problems that then you were going to work on and hang out in that group for the entire conference. So the conference was a whole weekend and you hang out for like, it was like four days that you hang out. And then on the very last day, every group is going to have a presentation and be able to present what they figured out uh, for the entire class. Decide where AIDS money should go for the year of 2023 regarding these four impossible problems. Apparently you were put in the group that like best fit you. And so I was like, I, hmm. Where am I gonna go? I don't know. But getting there, oh my God, guys, I got there. It was my first time traveling inside Canada, which is way better than traveling outside a country because it's like so quick. You just go in and bit bop, boop. It's so beautiful. Are you kidding me, Vancouver? Absolutely stunning. Beautiful place. I'm like, I should live here, I think, actually. Except it is quite wet. I do not like being wet. So I'm there and I brought my mom. But when I go to the conference place, mom didn't come, okay? So I have to walk in this building by myself. I'm terrified. I was pooping my pants. I was crying. I'm like, mom, I think we need to go home. I can't go into this building. I can't do it. And she's like, get 
I'll move on. So I enter the building. I go in. The lady goes, oh, you have to go upstairs. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so sorry to inconvenience you by being here. <laughs> Forgive me. I'll go upstairs. I go upstairs. I only know like two people, <laughs> two people, three people that I've been communicating with in the past. That's all I got. And then besides that, I'm like, Alrighty, good, good stuff. The first like hour and a half was for mingling and also breakfast. So I grabbed some fruit and then I sat by myself at a little table for one because I was not mingling. Absolutely not. The fuck was I supposed to do? I'm like the youngest person there. I'm like, did, did, did. I'm autistic in this bitch. First of all, I was like, I need to gather my surroundings. I need to take a, take a few laps, acknowledge where I am, know what the space looks like from an aerial view, be able to map out the space. And then I'll finally feel safe in here and in this room, figure out where all the exits are and all the bathrooms and anywhere that I need to go. And then I'll be okay. And then came the time where you had to go into the auditorium where there were round tables that you had to sit at. You had to choose a table. Are you kidding me? So I just did what I like usually do, which is front and center. You know, I'm not gonna worry about people. I don't have friends here. I'm gonna sit right where the speaker is, right in front of them. We had a speaker, we had a motivational speaker talking about working together and all of the importance of seeing other people's viewpoints and listening without getting defensive and all this stuff. And then we split off into our little groups and did like our little group sessions. And I was in the self-injurious behavior group. Which I was like, I, you know what? I don't think I saw that coming, to be honest. Didn't know that these dudes knew I had self-injurious behaviors. Okay, alrighty. Before the conference started, we were all sent like a bunch of articles to read about all of the different questions. So it's not like I was unfamiliar with self-injurious behaviors, but I'd say prior to those articles, I wasn't paying as much attention to people with self-injurious behaviors or just the concept in general as I am now. That's for sure. That group and that discussion was... Some, it could have gone on forever. <laughs> we didn't have enough time. I wish we could have just had a few days just to sit there and talk and share about our experiences to each other. Because there were so many different people in that one room. We had two workers for uh, Aid Canada or like affiliates of Aid Canada hosting. And then there was also me. Uh, there was another autistic person who, I don't know if we're doing names and stuff, uh, but they were older than me but like a young adult still 30s there were social workers and uh, workers from other autism organizations from all over Canada like autism Yukon okay there were two moms of autistic kids and then there was one doctor there was one psychiatrist for autistic kids can I just say that I was so scared <laughs> just because I'm an autistic person and any autistic person would probably be nervous in that situation but because I felt like there was so much power around me and I was so unsure of what the power was going to do and what it felt until it started to talk and people started to talk and then I felt really okay <laughs> the more I talked to people in different autism organizations the more I realized that they're definitely not neurotypical so <laughs> I valued like their opinion even more because I'm like oh you care so much because um it's you Barbara but everyone really valued my opinions and the opinion of the other autistic person in the room big time because I think that they want to understand autistic people that's the end of it everyone in that room wants to understand autistic people and how to help them best we watched videos from autistic people and from parents of autistic people explaining their own personal experience with self-injurious behaviors and how it impacts them and their family and their day-to-day -day lives and it was a lot and what was most important and impactful for me was listening to the moms that had autistic kids that were in so much pain and all they could think about was how much their kid hurt and how much their kid was hurting and how much pain their kid was in and how they just wish they could advocate the best for their kid and they don't know how and they don't know what it is and they don't know what to do to help and they just want to know everything that they can. And the way that they looked at me, I could have talked to them forever and I wish I had time to. And I'm going to talk about it now because we're here. And I can, I can do what I want. This is my channel, hello. I'm not gonna give you like the presentation that we did because the presentation is, you know, it's like more boring. It was more corporate and like bing, bang, boom. And this is what we're gonna do moving forward. And this is where you're gonna put your money. And this is what, you know, we figured out. However, I will say I was very excited to present it. I was like, may I please be in their like page? We were gonna ask you anyway. I did ask the doctor to come up and do some parts with me. Uh, her name is Dr. Anna Marie Richardson. She's fabulous. I felt some things hearing from her perspective as someone who sees these kids every single day. It was really powerful and something that a lot of people 
needed to hear. So yeah, I'm going to talk about self-injurious behaviors for a little bit and then I'll go on and tell you what A did in like all of last year, what the vibe was, what we figured out. But let's get to the bread and butter. I mean, uh, get to the meat and potatoes. That's what I want to say, the meat and potatoes. First thing, a lot of people think that self-injurious behaviors are the same as self-harming, which absolutely not. So, you know, I'll stop you right there in your tracks if that is your thought. The difference between self-harming and self-injurious behavior is the intent of the action. So the intent behind self-harming is to harm, to hurt. The intent of self-injurious behavior is not to hurt oneself. That's just what ends up happening because it's too much. It's a result of, and this is what people are, you know, debating and stuff. I think it's just, you know, when there's way too much going on, you're, f- it's like the tip, it's like the, the peak of an autism meltdown, self-destruction. When everything is just so much that it's like, nope, mayday, we're pressing the red button and like we are no longer in control and this body feels like it's no longer safe. There's a range of self-injurious behaviors and there are some that are more severe than others. For example, a self-injurious behavior includes picking at your nails or like really just destroying your skin. If you're harming yourself by accident, that's a self-injurious behavior. Anything that you do that hurts you and you didn't do it because it hurt, you did it for a different reason and then it just acts and it just hurt and you can't stop doing it or like that doesn't make you stop doing it you still are doing it that's self-injurious behavior that's sibs i have trichotillomania so i pull hair out of places which is not the goal and i hate that it hurts but sometimes you just it just has to go at the time there have been quite a few times where i've had like a really big meltdown and i have banged my head against the wall or against the floor or against a desk or my hands not fun really not safe in kids and it breaks my heart with little kids little autistic kids that just need help i also uh partake in a lot of compulsions and i find like my ocd compulsions cycle through and i don't have it all the time but some of them that i used to do are like i would roll my eyes so much like like they would hurt and i would have to keep rolling them but they would hurt so much and i hated it but i'd have to some other ones where i had one with my tongue where i have to and it would hurt but I couldn't stop doing it. It's like the pain that it is on the outside is nothing compared to the pain that it is on the inside to not do it. Like I need to do it so bad that it feels like it'll feel good if and when it happens. And it doesn't, but it kind of does at the time. It kind of is a little anxiety relieving at the time. I go back to those times where I had like the really big meltdowns and I was banging my head on the wall and stuff. And what was happening to me there was I was just so frustrated with the conversations with the put downs like it every single time that happened it was to do with a relationship like someone I was talking to it wasn't just I don't I don't get that I've never gotten there by myself when alone I've only ever gotten there when someone was really against me or someone was arguing with me or uh, something uh, I wasn't receiving what I needed nine times out of 10. It was from a parent. It was like, I I was so, so frustrated. The frustration was bigger than my body and it like needed to be bigger than my body. I needed to be bigger than my body because my emotions were. So I wrote a book. Don't know if you guys know that or not, but in my book and like kind of like the gist of my book or like the purpose of my book, I think is to kind of start branching and understanding the ideas of autism doesn't exist by itself autism exists as a human person evolves and there are a lot of human person things that a lot of autistic people and kids are having difficulty with and branching the concept and the conversation of childhood trauma and autism or like you know a child not vibing parents are not vibing parents are not maybe parenting the best the best that they can, or the best that the kid needs, which happens never. I think it has a lot to do with emotional regulation and the care that an autistic person receives from their parents, the kind of care, the kind of way that they communicate. And unfortunately, what I think happens far too often is that the caretakers of autistic people that are very prone to self-injurious behaviors are not the best to them and treat them like they're not even there or not even people talk about them around them like it, it acts like they're not even a person and that and that would fuck you up that would fuck anybody up that would fuck me up 
that would make me so freaking frustrated. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, one thing that they said in the conference was that a self-injurious behavior is always because something just happened and i'm like what why are we saying that for so for real why are we saying that for real is that for real for real because i feel like that's not necessarily true they're like what you feel really explain this to us i'm like well why do you feel like that is true what like i could just be thinking you know it doesn't mean that something awful has to happen right then and there because also most of the time Y'all don't know what the awful thing is because the awful thing to neurotypicals or to anyone else, it's not the same as the awful thing to that single autistic person. Autistic people are going to disagree on what's awful and what's not. The most people with self-injurious behaviors are kids. And I think that this makes sense to do with emotional regulation and growing up and parenting and childhood trauma. Being a kid is the most difficult part of most autistic people's lives. It's so painful and hard to have all these sensory issues all your life and have no one explain them to you or no one understand them and just be in pain a lot of the time and not have people really get you for any length of time, right? Most autistic people, there's a period of time where you're not diagnosed and people just don't get it. But with growing up and with experiences and with learning their emotions and what they are and who they are as a person and their body, the self-interest behaviors usually get more mild as time goes on. There's probably going to be a time where that child is bigger than the parent and when they can be so strong to hurt themselves they can definitely be strong enough to hurt the parent and I'm like what's going on like what are you doing about this it, what help do you have and they're like yeah I don't freaking know all of them every parent of an autistic kid that was there has said that they have had so much trouble trying to jump through any hoops that any government system can put them in to try to get some kind of help for them and their kid. Like I'm from Ontario. I didn't know that other provinces had respite. Like if you have an autistic kid, you have a few hours of respite like a week or whatever. What? We should, that should be um, a lot more places. Thing is, there aren't enough competent social workers out there. And the other thing is social work in general, like the people that are looking after our autistic kids, they're not the most like knowledgeable about autism. I'm really sorry to any social workers that are out there and they're like, I'm so knowledgeable about autism. It's not enough. You know, the schooling that you go through, it's not enough. You don't learn enough about autism, in my opinion, to be like with an autistic person all the time. You got to know like the most shit about autism. It's got to be like the biggest thing in, in your life. Well, I'm not just a person, of course, I would fucking say that, but <laughs> there aren't enough doctors. There's not enough anyone who knows anything about kids with self-injurious behaviors because most people don't want to deal with it because what, what, what do you say? What is the answer? These kids want to hurt themselves. How do we get them to stop hurting themselves? We need them to be happier. How do we get them happier? This is a whole bunch of fucked upness and about 18 different systems that need to be completely redone because every autistic person is so nuanced and it's so different and what they're going through in their little individual life is something that we could change every service in the world for and it still might not work out well and that's why personally for me I think at the end of the day it's educating people and educating people who end up being parents who can raise their kids you know in a better way understanding better accommodating better more relieving because let's be honest especially as kids you don't know what's bugging you those are the kind of things that adults tell kids those are the kind of things that kids look to adults for anytime a kid falls and they look up at me like what it would they're looking like what do i do how do i react what am i doing in this situation anyway there's not enough people that are working with kids with self-injurious behaviors that was one big thing that i learned from dr anna marie richardson she was like i think i'm the only doctor that is really, really trying to do stuff for these kids. Like she is going to their houses and everyone is just getting referrals and referrals and referrals to her. And she's like, I can only do so much. I'm the medication gal. She's a hard fucking worker and she's a hard advocate. And she is like campaigning everywhere for these kids and showing pictures of these kids and their injuries and being like, look, like we need funding. We need this and that and the other thing. It's definitely a population that gets swept under the rug because people are like, what do we do? 
I don't know the individual person's life and what they're going through and what they're thinking and why it's happening to them. That's why it's so complex though. It's not a one size fits all. It's not a one answer for everybody. We need more doctors. We need more competent social workers. We need more people that are able to take care of autistic people and people with self-interest behaviors. We need people that are actually qualified and actually good and actually not going to make it worse and actually helpful and actually available because the wait lists are just abs are just gnarly. No one can get in to see anybody and all these parents are struggling so hard and, and they can't do anything. You can't do anything. Like my, my number one advice would just be like, learn as much about autism as you can. Learn as much from autistic people because then maybe you'll find like the weird little nuanced things that you might not know that is bothering your kid that can't tell you what's bothering them or bring an autistic person into your house. Honestly, like I'm just like, bring me in your house. I will point out every single thing that I bet is bothering your kid because I will point out every single thing that I notice and that bothers me and it's going to blow your mind. It's probably about a million things. So that's what we got out of it. Holy fuck. So all year, all of 2023, Aid Canada has been putting together something for this project and that's something, that tangible something that we thought we could put money towards to do. We've made different resources for doctors, for social workers and for teachers about self-interest behavior and what are your duties and responsibilities and who else is around you that has other duties and responsibilities and what you can do, how to spot self-interest behavior, how to intervene if necessary, if possible, what supports are around and where you can go next. I know that I have a very autism heavy audience. So, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of you guys watching this right, right now that engage in self-interest behaviors or know someone who does. And I would love to discuss this and have a, you know, as much of a convo as you want about this. What do you think causes it? And, and listen, I don't want to hear the whole like, well, well, change your diet or something, it gets better. Or like take a supplement and it gets better. That's just make the autistic person happier. You know, that's just give them less stomach aches and they will have less meltdowns. Yes, facts. Thank you guys so much for being here and thank you for watching and thank you for listening and thank you for caring. I'm Paige Leal. This has been a Paige Leal video. Forgive me for not knowing anytime I'm going to post or update anything. I have PDA and sometimes I just am like, wow, I cannot do that thing at all today. Because sometimes work is like a hot stove and I have to put my hand on it. I'm like, it's going to hurt. I'm not supposed to put my hand on it but you gotta put your hand on it, Paige. If you like this video, if you like me, feel free to, you know, like this video and subscribe if you wanna do that. And, and follow me on TikTok too. If you don't follow me on TikTok, I'm almost, I mean, I'm not almost at 3 million, but like, it'll be cool once I get 3 million. I'll be like, ah, it's a number. Okay, talk soon. Peace out, my dudes. Love you, bye. This is the end of the video song. This video is to tell you the video's done. If you're hearing this, it's because the video's done. Go watch another one. Boop, boop. Have a good day. Love you so much. Bye.